when, when you say it was built by Israeli engineers, did you misspeak? No, no, somebody, you know, decades ago, we were the, running the place. So we held them, it was decades, many decades ago, probably five, de four decades ago, that we helped them to build these uh, bunkers in order to enable uh, more, more, uh, more space for the operation of the hospital within the very limited uh, size of this compound. Okay. All right. Well, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's sort of thrown me a little bit. This is my video update from Athens, Greece on this Tuesday, midday, November the 21st. Let's talk about some news. So yesterday in my video update, I played an interview of U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen telling MSNBC, I believe it was on MSNBC, telling MSNBC and... Uh, and the entire United States of America, all the citizens of the U.S., that the Biden White House must absolutely get $61 billion to the Alensky regime and to Ukraine. They have to get that $61 billion to Alensky in order to prevent the Putin from winning this war. And they need that money to fund their teachers and their first responders because, according to Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, Ukraine is 100% dependent on the United States of America. 100% dependent. Here is what Yellen said, quote, we can't allow Ukraine to lose a battle on the home front because it lacks enough money to keep school teachers in the classroom and first responders on the job when it's fighting valiantly on the battlefield. So Ukraine is utterly dependent on this aid. So it's very interesting to see a U.S. Treasury Secretary talk about keeping a war going and talk about defeating the Putin. I never knew that that was part of uh, a Treasury Secretary's job requirements. And, uh, and I also find it uh, ve very interesting that uh, she's going on the uh, mainstream media and just openly telling the people of the United States, that uh, they need to get money to the Alensky regime so that they can fund Ukraine's, so they can pay for Ukraine's teachers and first responders. While in the United States, you have uh, a Bidenomics economic uh, disaster. And I would imagine that $60 billion could go a long way to to helping the people of the United States and uh, and helping teachers and helping first responders, American teachers and American first responders. I, I find it so interesting that they're they're so open about it. The Biden White House is so open about just just telling the American people, look, let's just get money to Ukraine so we can pay the salaries of uh, of Alensky, his administration and teachers and first responders. Not your salaries, <laughs> not, not help you guys out, but to get money to, to help them out, to, to, to pay for their, uh, for their salaries. And, and you know that 61 billion, of that 61 billion, how much of it would actually go to the salaries of, uh, of first responders and of teachers, which I know for a fact in Ukraine is extremely low. I imagine a, a teacher in Ukraine is making a couple of hundred hundred bucks a, a month, if that. So, so most of the money is, is just about the grift, right? It's keeping the, the grift and the, and the washing machine going. And then it's very much like, uh, like a teenager who's, who's had a credit card and they've just been running up the credit card, buying all kinds of stuff, having a great time. And all of a sudden the, uh, the money is, is gone and uh, the credit card has to be cut up, <laughs> cut up and thrown away. And, and the teenagers like, just, 
just just give me the card for one more go. Just let me go on one more spending spree before you before you cut it up. There there must be some money in in the bank in the bank, mom and dad, so I can you know just go on one more big shopping spree. <laughs> That's what it's like. It's like the, the, the American voter. And the American voter is like the mom and dad. It's like the American voter is, is going to the Biden White House and saying, enough. Not one more cent. Give me that, give me that credit card, little Janet Yellen. <laughs> give me that credit card. I'm going to cut it up. Anyway, it's, it's panic. It's panic. Not so much that, uh, not so much because they're losing the conflict, yes. They are panicking because they're losing the conflict. But to have the U.S. Treasury Secretary be so panicked about it means that, you know, she's worried that, that the laundry machine, the, 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 the washing machine, she's worried that the washing machine is, uh, is going to stop spinning, you know, and she's the Treasury Secretary. So I imagine there's a lot of uh, wealthy people and a lot of big globalist companies that are putting a lot of pressure on Yellen to keep the washing machine going. There's a lot of contracts in place as well for uh, for Ukraine land and agriculture and and energy uh, deals, the Monsatos and the Black Rocks, and I'm sure they're saying, "Hey, wait a minute, we signed these uh, these deals with you, and now things are going really bad. At least let's get 60 billion in there and try to keep this thing going and and make some some more money off of this thing." So anyway, uh, I just wanted to bring that up because I think it really it really highlights the the panic and desperation from the Biden White House and uh, the Biden White House donor class to uh, to continue to keep the washing machine spinning and spinning round and round and round. So uh, the situation in Ukraine, yeah, not not going good at all. There uh, there was a further. 100 million in weapons given to to Ukraine yesterday. U.S. announces 100 million military aid package for Ukraine. This coincided with with uh, Lloyd Austin's surprise visit to Kiev. He surprised everybody when he arrived in Kiev. But uh, yeah, Lloyd Austin came to Kiev and he only brought 100 million. It's a lot of money, but in in terms of funding for Kiev, it's like uh, pennies. It's like giving Alensky pennies. And so I imagine uh, the Ukraine military and the Alensky regime is not very happy. Uh, Brian Berletic, he uh, posted on Telegram uh, a breakdown of, of what was given. And Brian's uh, assessment was that this is pretty pretty meager stuff that they've given the, uh, the Alensky regime. Actually, he says U.S. sends new but meager arms package to Ukraine. This is posted on his Telegram channel. Only one high Mars launcher is being sent, likely to cover losses, not for additional launch capacity since ammunition levels are insufficient to do so. No quantities listed for other arms because there are shortages of all listed systems. Three million small arms rounds sounds like a lot, but it's only about two to three loads loadouts for a single brigade at full strength, 4,000 men. It's basically Brian, who has been tracking this better than anybody, the, the weapons deliveries to Ukraine, basically is saying that this is, this is bad news if you're the Ukraine military and you're the Alensky regime. I imagine Alensky was not very happy with this $100 million in military aid. And we know from Bloomberg that... Most likely, there won't be any significant money going to the Alensky regime, at least until uh, January. Maybe they might get something in December if they're lucky, but any significant amount of money is not going to arrive to the Alensky regime until January. I imagine that Alensky met with Lloyd Austin, and Lloyd Austin was like, I brought, I brought $100 million in military aid, and uh, we're going to support you for as long as it takes. And I'm sure Alensky was like, a hundred million. What is this? A hundred million. hundred million, I can only buy two, three homes. Maybe four. <laughs> you know, I'm sure Alensky was, yeah, I'm sure he was very upset with, uh, with Lloyd Austin. 
uh, Burns in Ukraine, Lloyd Austin in Ukraine. I imagine Burns is in Ukraine trying to get uh, the Alensky regime to some sort of a negotiation or ceasefire. Imagine Burns is kind of going there to feel things out. But his assessment is going to be that Ukraine has lost and uh, the U.S. needs to needs to cut its losses and um, try to push the Alensky regime to some sort of negotiated settlement. I imagine that Austin, he's probably part of the of the hardcore neocon faction that followed up on Burns's visit, and he's probably telling the Alensky regime the the opposite of Burns where I think Burns is, is going there and he's kind of assessing the situation and uh, just coming out with, uh, with the conclusion that this thing is, is toast. I imagine that Austin goes there, he brings 100 million, not much, but at least something. And uh, he's part of the hardcore neocon faction. Remember it was Austin that said he would like to give Russia a bloody nose. Remember when the conflict first started, Austin said uh, that Ukraine has to fight Russia in order to give Russia a bloody nose. So I imagine Austin is probably like, look, uh, just here's 100 million, we'll get some more to you, but let's let's just keep on fighting. I imagine that's that's Austin's message. Keep on fighting and do whatever you have to do to uh, to keep on fighting. And the Russian the Russian uh, foreign uh, intelligence going along this uh, this line of of keeping the fight going russian foreign intelligence came out with with an assessment well, with some intel intel and assessment where they claim that the alensky regime is being pushed it's being advised being pushed to recruit everybody 17 to 70 year olds that is what the sbr said in a statement and they claim that they have uh, reliable data to back up this claim once again these are russian sources so um, maybe you believe it maybe you don't but here is what the the sbr said the american and british curators recommend that the ukrainian leadership lower the minimum draft age to 17 years and increase the maximum one to 70 years, as well as call more women to arms. So, you know, the, the statements in the past from Russian intel about Ukraine uh, calling women, women to arms and sending women to the front lines has proven out to be true. And so here you have the, the Russian intel, the foreign Russian intel service, now saying, look, it's not only women that uh, that the U.S. Lloyd Austin and uh, and the U.K. David Cameron, perhaps it's not only women that they are pushing Ukraine to send to the front lines. Now they want Ukraine to to just basically draft everybody, 17 to 70 years old, and uh, I I imagine this is correct intel from Russia because we've been getting a lot of articles which uh, from the collective West media, which are saying that Ukraine has run out of soldiers. We even have uh, Joe Biden saying that Ukraine is running out of soldiers. Biden said that his biggest fear is that uh, Ukraine uh, will not have any soldiers left to, uh, to use all the weapons that the U.S. is sending to the Alensky regime. And the U.S. ambassador, uh, the Russian ambassador to the U.S., he said that... Uh, that continuing to to send money to to Ukraine, this hundred hundred million in military aid, he said all it is is uh, a sedative pill. That's the words that he used, a sedative pill. The Russian ambassador to the United States said the message about another American arms supply to the regime is nothing more but a sedative pill prepared by overseas benefactors for Elensky. The situation on the front and in the Ukrainian state institutions is on the verge of complete collapse. That is coming from Antonov. Keep the fight going until the, what did Lindsey Graham say multiple times? Until the, the last Ukrainian, was it Graham that said that or Austin or both of them? 
but uh, fight till the last Ukrainian and we'll give you whatever money we can give you and uh, just keep it going for however long you can. If that means women, women. If that means teenagers, teenagers. If, if that means 70 year olds, 70 year olds. We are seeing the United States, the UK and the EU because you know that the EU and Germany, specifically Germany, they're, uh, they're in on this. They're in on, on a full-scale uh, demolition of, of Ukraine in order to, in their mind, in order to, uh, to degrade Russia and also keep, keep the, the washing machine spinning, keep it spinning. The hope strategy as well, maybe if you could continue to fight longer, a little bit longer, maybe something will happen. Maybe there'll be some regime change in Moscow. Maybe something, some sort of, of, uh, of miracle. Not that they would believe in miracles, these guys. But uh, maybe something will happen that will change the dynamics on the front lines. Worst case scenario, if you're a guy like Sullivan, you know, an election campaign guy, you're thinking, you know, at the very best, at the, ver at the very worst or the very best, depending on, <laughs> on how you view what's going on in Project Ukraine, you know, maybe we can get them to, to just continue to, to fight and not collapse until after the 2024 elections. And if uh, Trump does indeed win, and if Biden doesn't run or if Biden loses, well, then the collapse after 2024 can be blamed on the Republicans. They can say the Republicans didn't supply the weapons, they didn't supply the money, they didn't support Alensky like they should have. And if the Republicans gave Alensky this and that, well, then they, they would have won. So, you know, maybe, maybe guys like Sullivan are kind of saying, well, let's just try and keep it going. And um, at, a, at a very minimum, if this can go on till November 2024, and should we lose the elections and Trump is, is elected or another Republican is elected, then, uh, then we can just blame the collapse on, on the Republicans. And, and Sullivan can go, can go on to his, his next job. He'll probably be a, a host for, for CNN or, or something like that. A book deal. A book deal. Yeah, that's, that's usually how all of this works. And that brings us to an article from the... The Guardian, just seeing how I'm doing on time. And The Guardian, they read an article with the title, Ukrainian Optimism Fades at Start of Another Winter of War. Rumors of tensions at the top, exhaustion after two years of fighting and frustration with allies dampen the mood in Kiev. So the, the article from The Guardian it uses the word gloom. It says that the, the atmosphere in, uh, in Kiev, in Ukraine, is full of gloom. That is the word that they actually use in this article. And uh, let, me, let me read you some of this Guardian article because it paints quite a picture. It says, there is a subtle yet unmistakable sense of gloom in Kiev at the moment, and not only because of the dark afternoons and plunging mercury of an Eastern European November, a number of internal and external factors have combined to create the most downbeat mood about the prospects for a swift and decisive Ukrainian victory over Russia since the first weeks of the full-scale invasion. At the end of last year and beginning of this one, there was such euphoria. Now we see the other extreme, the down. And I guess we will see some ups and downs for some time to come, said Bartos Sistrowski, who last month finished a four-year posting as Poland's ambassador in Kiev. Remember the article that I talked about two days ago from, I believe it was from... Francis Le Monde, which said that Ukraine is facing a perfect storm. This is, this is the perfect storm that the, that the Guardian is going to talk about in this article. It says that uh, there is the horror unfolding in the Middle East. This is the perfect storm now that the Guardian is going to they actually um, summarize it point by point in this article. 
Uh, there is the horror unfolding in the Middle East, which has taken attention away from Ukraine and slowed down flows of ammunition. There is also increasing U Ukraine fatigue in Western capitals, as well as the looming prospect of a second term for Donald Trump in the U.S., which could upend support from Kiev's biggest ally. So that's the that's the perfect storm. And they actually talk about each point in detail. For example, they talk about Ukraine fatigue and the subheading as they talk about Ukraine fatigue is is uh, the C word. That's what they use. That's the subheading. They say the C word, the, the ceasefire word. You know, you can't. Is it incredible that you, you look at the war in uh, Israel and, uh, and the bombing of Gaza, you look at the, the conflict in Ukraine, and they've made it out so that saying the word ceasefire has become like a dirty word. Just can't say it. You can't say ceasefire. You can't say ceasefire for Gaza. You can't say ceasefire for Ukraine. And the Guardian actually says that the, head, the heading in this article is the C word. And it just says that, that there's fear because of Ukraine fatigue. There's fear in Kiev that, that the, uh, the collective West is going to push Ukraine to, to negotiate a ceasefire. And, and people are, are worried about that in Kiev. So it's, it's just incredible that, that you can't even bring yourself to say the word ceasefire. If you can't say the word ceasefire, you're never going to get to a ceasefire, and that is what Ukraine needs. Desperately, Ukraine needs a ceasefire, even though in this article they interview some uh, Ukraine military officials who, uh, who claim that if there is a ceasefire, then the Russians are just going to use it to rearm, which is ridiculous. Uh, we heard the same thing with the use of the ceasefire in, uh, in Gaza, didn't we? You know, if, if there's a ceasefire, then Hamas is going to rearm. We've been hearing this about Ukraine as well for the last year and a half. If there's a ceasefire, then Russia's going to to rearm. They love to they love to say that. Let me let me read you something here. A statement from Podoliak. Let's be clear: there is no option for real negotiations. All it would be would be an operational pause. Russia would use this to significantly improve its army, carry out new mobilization, and then relaunch its war with even more tragic consequences for Ukraine. Podoliak said in an interview at the presidential administration in Kiev. The ceasefire excuse. Can't have a ceasefire because the other side's going to use that time to rearm. What script writers came up with that one? The reality is that uh, the ceasefire, if there ever was an operational pause or a ceasefire, if there ever was an agreement for such a thing, it would be uh, Ukraine. It would be the collective West, NATO, that would use that time to rearm. I mean, we know that from history. That's a fact. Uh, the Minsk agreements were used by NATO, by the collective West, to build the most uh, powerful European army, Ukraine, the Ukraine proxy. That's what, uh, that's what NATO did with that ceasefire if you want to call the Minsk agreement a ceasefire. Uh, Merkel said as much, Hollande said as much, Poroshenko said as much. They all admitted that the Minsk agreement was all about buying time in order to build up Ukraine's military to fight Russia. They're on record saying as much. Actually, I think Merkel said it three times in three different uh, interviews. So we know from history that when there has been a ceasefire, it's actually the collective West that uses the ceasefire to, uh, to rearm and rebuild uh, their military. And we know that from the Minsk agreements. Keep in mind that if they just followed the Minsk agreements, the collective West, if they just implemented the Minsk agreements, you would have a Ukraine with Donetsk and Lugansk. A Ukraine with Donetsk and Lugansk, and you would have saved the lives of 500, 600,000 men, a million men. And the Minsk agreements did not bar uh, Ukraine from entering the European Union. NATO, off limits, but Ukraine would have been able to join the EU if they had just implemented 
the Minsk agreements, which they they signed. They were well, they were signatories to it, France and and Germany, but they chose the other route. And uh, and you know, Russia doesn't even need a ceasefire to rearm. They don't need a pause to rearm. Russia's Russia is going to build a military at the end of January. They're going to have an additional 420,000 professional soldiers, professional, contracted, trained up soldiers. They don't need a pause to rearm. The Russian military has been fighting the, the NATO proxy in Ukraine with the same military that they pretty much started out with. And then they've been building a whole nother military. They've been stockpiling missiles. Uh, they're now manufacturing drones like crazy. They don't need a pause to, to rearm. It's, it's just, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Russia has used the same military to defeat three NATO proxies. And they've built up an additional 420,000 strong professional contracted military as well, which hasn't even seen any action. And we're not talking about what Ukraine is doing when they're going out in the streets and grabbing people um, uh, in cafes or wherever they're grabbing them and throwing them into vans or grabbing military aged men walking in the street and throwing them into vans and then sending them to the front line. We're talking about uh, professional contracted trained uh, soldiers, 420,000 of them. So the whole ceasefire thing is a nonsense, it's absolute nonsense. Anyway, uh, this article from the guardian, it then talks about this uh, this gloom, this perfect storm that is uh, that is hitting the Alensky regime in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine fatigue, the conflict in the Middle East. We all know about that. How money and weapons are going to be prioritized for Israel, and then it talks about Trump. It says the looming prospect of a Trump second term. They're very afraid of Trump. If Trump uh, if Trump wins, well, then we all know that. That Trump is buddy buddies with Putin, right? The Putin. The Don is buddies with the Putin. <laughs> that nonsense. They're still stuck on Russia Gate from four years ago, five years ago. Hillary Clinton and Robbie Mooks made up Russia Gate. Boy, did they, boy, did Hillary Clinton poison the United States of America with that one, with that lie. Boy, did she really undermine and poison the, the US, the, the, the democracy constitution of the United States of America with that whopper, the Russiagate lie. She did a lot of damage to the U.S. with that one. And, uh, and then the article finishes off by talking about the possibility that Alensky might call the elections back on. You know, we know he canceled the elections, but the Guardian says that says that Alensky might actually call the elections again because he may seek a mandate by winning the elections in March. And that's not far off. March 2024. You're talking about three months, three, four months by uh, calling the elections back on again. The calculus is that Alensky would win those elections and it would be seen as a mandate for the Alensky regime to continue the war in Ukraine. So there's, a, there's that bit of reporting from, from The Guardian. Let me read you what they say here. The president is acutely worried about the Churchill phenomenon. Because Alensky is Churchill, right? <laughs> right? Everybody watching from, uh, from the UK, Alensky is the new Churchill. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have the Churchill phenomenon. Okay. The president is acutely worried about the Churchill phenomenon, according to one informed source of electoral defeat for a successful wartime leader with presidential elections due next March. There had been some suggestion Alensky might attempt to hold a vote, giving himself a new mandate before what may be a more difficult phase of the war. So the people talking about Alensky perhaps calling the elections back on so that he can, he can win a new mandate to keep, uh, to keep the war going. 
But of course, you have the Churchill phenomenon, which is that Alensky might lose. So there's that fear that Alensky could lose the elections. What to do if you're the little green man? What do you do if you're Alensky? What do you do? You pack your bags and go to your house in Miami, one of your many homes in Miami or LA. If you're the little green man, you follow the advice of your wife and you know that Alensky's wife is like, get, get out, get out of this mess. Let's get out of this mess. You know that's what she's telling the Z-man. Anyway, let's, uh, let's move on here. We have an announcement from Finland that they're going to, it looks like they're going to completely close their border with Russia. And this could be happening tomorrow, actually, the 22nd of November. Finland is likely to close its entire border with Russia starting tomorrow evening, according to one of the country's largest newspapers, Il Talekti. The reason is that Russia has started pushing large masses of Somali, Syrian, and Iraqi migrants towards the Finnish border. It's all Russia's fault. They're closing the border because the Putin, the Putin is pushing migrants into Finland. That Putin, that Putin, he's so, he's so evil, the Putin. I thought that, that the EU was all about migrants, but they don't like it when the migrants are coming from Russia. Is that, is that how it goes? They, they, they're happy when the migrants are coming via Greece, Italy, but they're not happy when the migrants come from Russia. I don't know how, how that works, but anyway, I thought that the EU, I, I would imagine that the EU would be thanking Putin because isn't, isn't, isn't Ursula all about and Burrell all about the whole, you know, let's let migrants in. I don't know. I don't understand the, the EU's thinking on that one, but uh, let's see. Peskov said that Finland has chosen the path of confrontation with Russia from the Kremlin's point of view. This is a big mistake. Finnish authorities reported a spike in asylum, speak, in asylum seekers arriving at its eastern border on November 12th. The asylum seekers are foreigners who pass through Russia from third countries such as Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Somalia. Finnish media also reported in September that Russia has been building up its military bases along the border with Finland. Well, of course Russia is going to build up its military bases. Absolutely. Finland is NATO and Russia is going to need to uh, to build up its military presence on the border with Finland because you never know. You never know. This is this is the choice that Finland, the government of Finland made. The dancing queen, Santa Marin, who now works at Tony Blair's think tank. Interesting how that works, huh? She's been rewarded with a job at Tony Blair's think tank. She also had a TV show as well. So she got rewarded quite handsomely for, for getting Finland into, into NATO. And now, and now Finland has to deal with a Russian military buildup right on its border. Yeah. And, you know, closing off the border is going gonna, is gonna to be bad. It's going to be bad for, uh, for the Finnish economy, for many of the, of the businesses that benefited a lot from from the Russians crossing over. And, and there were Finnish that were also crossing over. So, you know, at the end of the day, the people on both sides get hurt by this, the small business owners and, and, and uh, the tourism, I guess. And, you know, it's, they're the ones that, that pay the price for this closing of the border. And of course you cut off the, the interaction and communication. You know, if people can't visit each other, and they can't talk to each other and realize that, you know, the Russians realize, hey, the people from Finland are, are pretty cool. And the people from Finland go to Russia and they say, the people in Russia are pretty cool. Everything's not like what my government is telling me. Well, you know, you never, you, you don't have that exchange and that communication and you never get to, to a point where, where, where people are like, you know, there's no reason to hate one another. You know, I go to Russia and I like the people and the Russians say, I go to Finland and I like the people. So you're going to cut that completely off now as well. So anyway, uh, that is that is what's going on at the border. And Hungary, Hungary is uh, having. I think they're going to you're going to be having the the European Parliament elections coming up in Hungary, 
and they're putting up billboards with Ursula van der Crazy and Soros Jr. around Budapest. At least this is what Reuters is reporting. I don't know if this is true or, or not true. Maybe this is just one billboard, but I don't know. And they're saying that Orban's uh, party in preparation for the elections with Soros and van der Leyen. And they're vilifying, according to Reuters, they're vilifying van der Leyen. Hungary, Hungary erects billboards vilifying EU's van der Leyen. The billboards depict Ursula van der Leyen alongside Alex Soros, the son of liberal Hungarian-born financier George Soros. Hungary's ruling party unveiled billboards vilifying European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen on November 20th, the first time it has made her a personal target in a campaign similar to one against her predecessor that angered Brussels. The billboards erected overnight to launch a campaign for next June's European parliamentary elections depict von der Leyen alongside Alex Soros, the son of liberal Hungarian-born financier George Soros, a perennial target of hostility from Prime Minister Viktor Orban's Fidesz party. The slogan reads, let's not dance to their tunes. And so a lot of the media is upset. The EU parliament, parliamentarians are upset at these billboards. Reuters is upset. I've seen Greek media, they're upset. The Greek media is very EU friendly. They're like super duper uber EU friendly. They're very upset. How dare Hungary put up billboards vilifying von der Leyen and Soros Jr. <laughs> I don't see anything wrong with these billboards. I mean, the slogan is, is don't dance to their tunes. Let's not dance to their tunes. All right. It's a pretty, pretty moderate slogan. I mean, it's not a big deal. I don't think it's like a secret that uh, Soros finances like half of the EU parliament, is it? I think that's pretty well known. Uh, I think it's like documented that like something like 30 or 40 or maybe even 50 percent of uh, EU parliament MPs are getting funded by one of Soros' his, his NGOs or think tanks or whatever. I mean, I don't think that's like a secret. So, you know, putting up a, a billboard with the slogan saying let's not let's not dance to their tunes is pretty mild. I mean, I don't understand what uh, what the fuss is all about. Why such anger towards uh, Orban and his Fidesz party? Uh, they don't like the, the transparency of it all, do they? <laughs> just own up to it. EU parliament members just don't own up to it and say, yeah. I'm getting money from Soros Sr. and little Soros Jr. Yeah, they pay me. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not... You should be proud of it, I guess. You know, if, if you're getting the money from Soros, why, why be upset when people talk about it? If anything, you should be proud and say, yeah, he gave me a couple of million. Damn right, he gave me 10 million. That's Soros. I got 10 million from him. Got a problem with that? <laughs> Got a problem with the 10 million I got from Soros and Soros Jr. <laughs> There's a reason why they don't like like the exposure and the transparency. There's a reason why they don't like it. Anyway, let's see. Bloomberg. Now, this is important. This is important from Bloomberg. China and Saudi Arabia signed currency swap worth $7 billion. Three-year swap deal is the latest sign of growing bilateral ties. Mideast countries look to shift non-oil trade away from dollars. More de-dollarization. And the interesting part, the important part to this story from Bloomberg is uh, Saudi Arabia and China. Once again, Saudi Arabia is moving closer and closer to, to, to China, well, to BRICS, we know that, and to China. And uh, it's seven billion in non-oil trade away from the dollar. Nothing to do with oil. Non-oil trade away from the USD. All right, let's uh, do a couple of clown worlds and we will wrap this video up. And how about this tweet from Alensky to the new president of Argentina? 
Mr. Javier Millet. Congratulations to Jay Millet on his convincing victory in Argentina's presidential elections. I appreciate his clear stance in support of Ukraine. I look forward to working together to strengthen our Ukraine-Argentina cooperation and restore international order based on international law. I said yesterday in my video that Millet is very uh, pro-Ukraine. He is very pro-Ukraine, and Alensky knows that. So that's not a good sign when it comes to Javier Millet. <laughs> that's not a good sign at all. Being pro-Ukraine means that you are pro-globalist. And for someone who claims to be a libertarian, that's not a good sign. Pro-Ukraine means you're pro-globalist agenda. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's not good at all. And Delensky, well, he's tweeting to Malay. Congratulations. He's not going to ask for money, though. <laughs> I think even Alensky knows not to ask for money from, uh, from the new president of Argentina. And uh, speaking about Trump, how the globalists, the Guardian, they're very worried that a Trump win in 2024 could be problematic for the Alensky regime. We had uh, a, a Democrat, I believe, a Democrat representative from New York, Mr. Dan Goldberg. He was on Jen Saki's Circleback Saki's show on MSNBC, and he said that uh, Trump, we have to prevent Trump from winning at all costs. He has to be prevented from winning in 2024, and he said that. Trump would have to be eliminated. His rhetoric is really getting dangerous, more and more dangerous. And we saw what happened on January 6th when he uses inflammatory rhetoric. Now in his recent Truth Social posts is incredibly, incredibly scary for anyone that might be trying to work in government. And it is just unquestionable at this point that that man cannot see, cannot see public office again. He is not only unfit, he is destructive to our democracy, and he has to be eliminated. That is a direct quote from Representative Goldman, and I believe Dan Goldman represents New York. So, wow, they, they are really, really afraid of Trump, man. They are really afraid of Trump. Wow. And finally... Let's uh, let's talk about this photo. I'll put it up on the screen right now of uh, Biden celebrating his his birthday. There was a big party here in Athens as well, celebrating Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece's favorite son's birthday. I mean, it was it was a huge party. People were partying like it's 1999. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, Biden was also having a, a bit of a of a celebration in the White House and they brought him a cake and the cake was <laughs> the cake was on fire <laughs> it was on fire and I just think this photo there's a lot of memes now coming out with this photo because I mean it's just it, it, it captures the Biden presidency so well Joe Biden sitting at the table smiling not really knowing what's going on and a birthday cake that's that's just a flame you know and that's that's the biden presidency right there that is the state of things in the united states that's the state of things in the world that is the biden presidency that photo captures biden's presidency so that's the video everybody i will leave it there pedro sanchez has just fired and expelled leone bellada spain's foreign former Minister of Social Justice who was advocating for Israel to be brought before the ICC for their war crimes. Belada was the first minister in all of Europe to condemn Israel and call for Netanyahu's arrest. So Sanchez fired Belada. I remember her statement. She was the first uh, European official to, to condemn Netanyahu.
El Sanchez got rid of her. All right, that's the video, everybody. TheDuran.Locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. Pick up a Duran long sleeve. 20% 20% off. Use the code the Duran 20 Take care.